I'm Robert Williams from MetalRules.com and joining me tonight in San Antonio, Texas as part of the Devolution 25 Years of Total Destruction Tour is Schmier, bassist and vocalist for German thrash legends Destruction. How you doing today, Schmier? I'm doing great. You have a great day today in, uh, here in, uh, in town. We get some good dinner with some friends, you know, nice sunny day, good venue, so it should be the perfect evening for us tonight. So ever since uh, you and Mike rejoined forces in the last part of the 90s, You've steadily been releasing albums every few years, you know, first with uh, All Hell Breaks Loose and then uh, The Antichrist, Metal Discharge. Is your new album, Devolution, a concept album? It seems like a lot of the themes on the album. Yeah, yeah I mean, that. we're dealing with the degeneration of mankind, you know, the, yeah, everything gets more rude and we're like, you know, we're progressing in many ways, but basically, like, our behavior is going back to cavemen, you know. So and, and that's the whole album dealing with the subjects, from little points like daily life stuff to political stuff, you know. And uh, I just think, uh, yeah, there was time for me to write that down. When I started writing lyrics for the album, I just was diving more into that shit, and I was I found out that you know the whole direction was clear. So the devolution title was. Uh, that's why we're also using this kind of um, acrostic, you know, this kind of concept with the, with the dots after the first uh, the first letter. Yeah. So, yeah, we want to be, you know, it, it's not a concept, concept album telling a big story. It's just uh, a wake-up call, you know, for everybody like, hey, you know, what's going on here? And the, the track listing actually spells devolution. Yeah, right, yeah. Right yeah. Do you guys uh, have a follow-up for Devolution in the works right now? Right now, after this tour, we're gonna mix our live album. So we come back from this tour where we have recorded two uh, two, uh, two shows out there, and we're gonna get a double live album out in July. And uh, yeah, which will be like two American shows and two shows out of the biggest festival in the world, the Wacken Festival. Wow! So they're gonna be. Uh, a great mix and uh, yeah, that should be out like I think at the end of summer. Something like that. I don't know about America. I know in, in Europe in the 31st of July. In America, maybe a little bit later. Are you gonna accompany that with like a live DVD? Yeah, DVD comes out in December. DVD takes a little longer because you got such more material. You have to cut all that. Be cutting pieces and stuff it, like all on this tour on the next tours. And we have this uh, huge performances in Wacken with all the old members, which also will be a part of that. And then we're gonna have all interviews with the old members. Oh, They're wow. diving back into history. And yeah, you know, usually I'm doing all the interviews, and it's kind of boring. So I think it's gonna be quite interesting what all the old members have to say about the old times, about the founding times of destruction. So it's gonna be nice documentary where people speak out that are not a part of destruction anymore but they were a big part of the beginning. Yeah, um, on the cover of uh, Sentence of Death, I mean, you guys all look so young. How did you originally meet Mike and the other guys? Yeah, there was nobody else. You know, when we started, it was just a, a big punk scene or the commercial pop music. And uh, there was just a handful of uh, headbangers at the time in my area. And one part was Mike and those guys, and they already had a band at the time. And then the other part was me and my friends, but most of our friends were punks, you know. So, but we met, we met up at some parties, and uh, yeah, they were looking for bass players. So they, that's how we met, you know. I was the only one that had long hair and listened to real metal. So the scene was very, very small at that time. You, you cannot imagine even how small it was. Were you guys hip to thrash back then, or were you still going for like new wave of British heavy metal type? No, stuff? the first songs we wrote were kind of more traditional new wave. But we always want to speed it up, so we're trying to get the speed in, you know, like uh, all bands at the time had one fast song on the album. Was the opening track was always speed and the rest was normal metal. Yeah. But as you grew up on the punk rock, we want to be more fast, more, you know, have this fucking, you know, this attitude, this aggressive attitude, more being more part of the band. We started that, the guitar player left, the singer left, and uh, then we found a disruption basically. So the beginning was more kind of, we wanted to go somewhere, the other people didn't want to go there, so then the band divided again and then disruption was formed. But we always wanted to be faster, louder, heavier, and you know, that was always the big part of the band. We didn't want to be one of those bands that do the normal metal, we wanted to be more, more aggressive. 
called it hardcore at the time because the yeah. word hardcore didn't even exist at the time. The word hardcore just meant to be more extreme. You know? Fucking heavy. Yeah. Was Steamhammer the first label to pick you guys up, or who was the first label you guys signed to? We had different offers, but Steamhammer seemed to be the label with the most interest and the most power. So, um, yeah, I mean, we had, did, did, we had four or five offers from different labels, and Steamhammer seemed to be the one that could, you know, could do something for us, and uh, yeah. We've been, that was an important step. I mean, the contracts were terrible at the time, we never made any money, but uh, they did a great promotion for us. So they spread the word yeah. and get us out there. That was important. Well, you've been with AFM Records now for the past three releases. How do you stack them up as a metal label? They're like one of the biggest labels in Europe. You know, uh -huh. So they do a good job for us. Of course, um, we've been on New Club last before, which is also maybe the biggest metal label in the world now. Yeah. And uh, that's still. There was some great years with them, but AFM also doing a great job, you know. So, you know, no, I mean, I've been very lucky in the last years. We've been working with very good labels, you know. Uh, not comparable with the past, where you have to wait for your money, you know, you have to go in court with your money. Uh, all those labels in the last years treat us really good, so uh, I cannot complain. You know. And I will always go back to Nuclear Blast because they they've been a very poor, important part of the. Reunited destruction, you know. Yeah, they, they did a great job for us when we came back. Well, you must be glad to be touring the states now. I, I read on your MySpace blog about a faulty European booking agent in the UK tour. What was the deal with that guy? You know, from more stuff so shady everywhere in the world. You know, yeah. so that guy was just basically a guy of a band who wanted to bring his band into the opening spot of our tour. So he said he's a booking agent, but he wasn't. So he kind of tried to get a tour together that didn't really work out yeah. too good and so his band could play in front of us, you know. No shit, he just weaseled his band in. Yeah, like and that. he said he had got a booking agency and it wasn't really true. It was like, he had all this on the internet. You could see it, you know, that he has websites, but he never did a real tour. It was our first, it was basically the fall of our booking agent in Germany that sent us out without really checking this guy's background. Yeah, but sometimes you can't because sometimes you know it's hard to get all the details out of those people because there's just too many promoters out there. And as we play so many shows, it's, it's impossible sometimes to get the whole background of every guy going, you know. Because yeah, it's it's music business. It's a lot of shady people working there, and sometimes we get warned from other people. But this English stuff was yeah, I guess. We learn from it, you know. I mean, we, we changed booking agency in Germany too now. Yeah. Because of, of one of the reasons we, why we did that was the English tour was uh, kind of it wasn't that bad in the end, but there was still, you know, some big problems happened there. And uh, but the good thing is that there's always a great interest in in our music, so we're going to play everywhere. We're going to go yeah. to China now the first time. We don't know how China will be. Maybe it's going to be crazy, you know. But you cannot. You have to take the risk, you have to take the advantage, you have to take the challenge. And it's, sometimes shows get cancelled, you can not do anything about it. I'm not the one who's cancelling the shows. The circumstances make it happen. There's maybe no equipment, there's no venue that you can play. But you, you travel there, you know, so sometimes I'm really pissed off when, when people are pointing at us like, oh, you cancel shows like this. No, we don't. We fucking travel there. Yeah. Days and other days, and then we can't play because it's, they treat us like shit there. So it's like... You know, it's sometimes you know people have been cancel the show in Calgary because there was no equipment, and people writing me hate mails like, "Oh, we traveled one and a half hours to go there." Man, I traveled fucking two days to go there to Calgary, and I couldn't play. I was the one who was pissed off the most. You know, we didn't get any fucking payment. We had to pay with all the bus and shit. We had to pay our, our our daily belongings. You know, we couldn't play because the fucking shit promoter, you know, didn't provide gear. You know, but how should we play a show then? You know. So sometimes it's difficult, but on the other side, you know, you have you play like hundred shows in a row and they're great, and then there's one show that fucks up. Fuck it, you know, life yeah. goes on. You know, all the other shows pay off for all for all the shit that happens in one gig. You know. In another uh, important show you guys are playing is the Chris Witch Hunter tribute show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Headlining that with with Sodom. What are some of your favorite memories of your fallen comrade Chris? You know, he was um, always a very funny guy. He enjoyed life, 
and that was also the problem of his career. He drink too much, you know. Yeah. He, he always was like, yeah, he beer here and a beer there, and he was always in good mood. But sometimes you have to just like set yourself limits, you know. And uh, I have uh, always great memories about him. He had he was playing with destruction for one whole tour. Uh -huh. He helped out when Tommy, our drummer, left. He helped out on a whole tour, which was a, a very funny tour. We've been headlining creator and uh, Rage was supporting us in 86 and it was a great tour and we always had contact with him over the years but I could see that he was struggling on the Sodom thing when he get out of Sodom he never came over to split you know uh -huh. so over the years when I saw him again and again at the shows That's he was always more going down more you know drinking more and more and stuff because yeah. he couldn't get over the whole problem and he didn't want to talk any, with anybody about that so it's sad that a funny person and a great talent, you know, was yeah, was going down like this so quick. You know, he was he was not he was young man. It's it's sad. And I remember last time we played in his area, he came to the show and and I was shocked about his circumstance. You know, because he was so drunk he couldn't even talk anymore. And there was a point where I told all his friends, man, what's going on with him? And they were like, we can't do anything. He's not listening. I guess, yeah, you cannot stop a person from self-destruction, you know, and yeah. he was in the way, and uh, it's sad, because he was a great person and a very warm person, you know, like, uh, he loved his his playing, and when he lost his playing and his band, he, he just, you know, yeah, he's, I, think, I guess he lost, he lost his sense of, of, of living, you know, and that's, that's sad, so. Well, that, that's a great thing that you guys are doing, being tribute to. Yeah, I mean, there was some trouble at the end, you know, where about uh, about the show because uh, the guy who's arranging the show is doing this for the first time, you know. So there was no contracts, no nothing, and then some stuff get up and down, and he, he kicked us off the building again because we were demanding for some stuff, just normal stuff, you know. And then I called up Andrew Ripper and said, "Dude, what's going on? This is a tribute show. Why? Why do you? Why? What's going on here?" And then. Everything gets set up together because it's you know this important show for the whole German thrash scene yeah. to, to play a tribute to a good old friend you know and then uh, that was kind of a weird situation uh, but still in the end everything is good you know uh, for us it's we've been we, we've been stopping our American tour exactly on the day before to do that show you know wow so when we planned this American tour five months ago we told the agent this American tour has to stop. Two days before the Rich Hunter gig, you know, yeah. it was it was very important for us. Some other German bands play their tours and don't care. We had we said we do this for Rich Hunter because he was a big part of the German starting of, of thrash metal, you know, and he was a good friend. So it was very important for us to play. So I'm looking forward to go there and uh, we'll we meet a lot of great friends again. You know, for people that I didn't see for many years, bands that are. You know, not so around so often anymore, like Assassin and and then bands like Darkness from the old days. You know, they all playing there again. So extended members of the Alliance of Hellhounds. Yeah, it's you know, it's uh, those people are some uh, like the singer of Assassin, Robert. He lives in China. You know, uh, so I don't I don't see those guys often. So it's great, you know, that we all come together again because those bands are the found, founders of European thrash. You know, yeah. even if some bands don't really exist anymore, but I'm looking forward to see all those people again, you know. So tell me about that track, Alliance of Hellhounds, where you had Biff from Saxon and Shagrath and Paul Diano. I mean, basically, it was always my dream to do that. How did you do it? I just asked all those people, you know, and some of them were like, right away, like, hey, great idea. And some others, you know, took a little longer. But, uh, I mean, you know, Saxon was my first heavy metal show in, in, in 1981. So it was a big fucking dream to record Biff, you know, uh, on, on yeah. the Destruction album. Did they record in separate studios? In yeah, we recorded separate studios. Some, in Biff, we recorded Biff in Italy on a festival. We played the same festival together and we brought in all the gear to record. And after the Saxon headlining show, Biff was singing in the, in the dressing room. We hooked up a whole studio in the dressing room. 
and then before singing in the dressing room after the show, uh, they both will sing. That sounds perfect. I would have never guessed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, with technology of today, you can really, you know, if you bring if you bring a good tone, uh, uh, um, how to say it, uh, engineer, uh -huh. and a little bit of good equipment, you can record here. You know, you could record vocals here. Yeah. It's just you couldn't record drums in here, but you know, certain stuff like vocals are easy to record anywhere. So did you like help them all out with the phrasing, like say this is kind of what I'm going Yeah, for. yeah, I did like a whole version with my vocals and I said, go for it, you know, everybody can bring in its own direction. And my, my, my basic form was just there to give them the idea how it could sound like. So everybody did its uh, own style at the end. Another track I wanted to ask you about, on the Metal Discharge album a couple years ago, they're on the bonus tracks. The Fuck the USA cover by The Exploited, that, yeah. that stirred up a bit of controversy back when that came out and I know you guys said it was more of a jab at the Bush administration than the American public, but um, seeing as Bush is not in office anymore, what's your current view on America? I mean, you know, the bad thing that could happen to America is that Bush is gone now and, you know, Obama is a president that has a, a view and it's like... Uh, yeah, it's it's fresh fresh blood in American policy. I think uh, the whole thing will open up for America again now, because uh, Bush made it really hard for everybody to you know to cooperate with America. And uh, we, we we did this the song as a free download when uh, Bush started the Iraq War because uh, we thought the Iraq War is not necessary, you know, and uh, it was just a statement against the war. But you get I got death threats, hundreds of death threats. Yeah. Even from Billy Milano. Billy, he didn't kill me yet. What's going on? <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, it's kind of silly though. You know, I mean, when my when, when my administration fucks up, yeah, I'm the first in line who says fuck fuck my government. They do so many mistakes, you know. Yeah. So uh, that song was just a statement against the war and not not against you know personal beings in America. It was. Uh, it, I mean, we didn't even write that song. Come on, it's a cover version. I think you guys you got know? more flack for that than the exploited. Exactly. The expo I think the exploited never get bashed as much as we did for doing the cover version, which is kind of ridiculous. Come on. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And it's at the end, it's only rock and roll. And if you cannot speak out what we think anymore, why should you play this fucking music? We, you know, it's we don't get rich. We have a good time. And sometimes, you know, as a, I see myself as a global person, I'm touring the world. I see many different things. There's no perfect society, you know. There's no perfect country, and sometimes it's just important to speak out, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. At the end, I mean, um, when we came back to uh, America the first time after we did the cover version in 2003 or four, it was. You know, the first tour, I was like, who's gonna come up here and gonna try to fucking hit me or shoot me, you know? But then Dimebag gets shot one year later. Yeah. And then I was like, ooh, you know, ugly, you know, because people sending me hundreds of death threats because I did a cover version of a song. And uh, when Dimebag got killed, I really, we thought about, should we tour America again, you know, because it's kind of, you know, dangerous. In the end, you, you cannot, you know, you can't do anything about it. If you, if you love your job, I love my fans, I have to go out there and play, take the challenge, you know, if I, if I die on stage, then it had to happen, you know, whatever, you know. Of course, it's it's been a weird situation, those dying back, around these dying back years, you know, because if you get death threats, it's never a good feeling, you know. Yeah. And when dying back got killed, it was like, I was in shock for weeks and weeks and weeks because that's just not, just not right, you know. If you want to face somebody, you know, get your fists up and tell them eye to eye, but not like that. That's fucking like coward bullshit. Whatever. That's that's life, I guess, you know. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Well, cheers yeah. to Dimebag, man. Cheers to Dimebag. It's one of the greatest American guitar players for metal ever. I know you're a busy guy, Shmir. Um, before we wrap this up, any last words for your fans out there? Thanks for coming out to the gigs. We have a lot of young kids coming back to the gigs now, which is fucking fantastic to see, you know. I mean, a whole new generation of Trash metal kids and like the old school. There was uh, some shows where there was like so many young people I couldn't fucking believe it. It's a global thing right now. People are fed up with all the commercial shit. The young kids want to have aggressive, honest music again, which is great to see. So yeah, I'm fucking proud to to be out here playing for the new generation again. And uh, 
one one day I will see those bands in Germany playing and I'm going to be at their gig, you know, and uh, see them in my country. And I look forward to that. So let the metal fucking flow, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs>